is Sander Marks. Um, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm the director of the Center for Precision Neuropsychiatry at Columbia University. And I have a particular interest in studying specific causes of um, mental illness, in particular also autoimmunity. Um, and I'll, I'd like to, for my talk today, uh, because there's been a lot of great talks already, give some complimentary perspective from a psychiatrist who's studying it from the, from the other end of things. So we, I try to sort of see if I had some cases that illustrate um, core things that I think might be relevant to generalize and think about also for future studies to complement the work of my colleagues in neurology uh, in a situation where you have a person who has a predominantly psychiatric condition and a severe one at that, if not treatment refractory and completely unresponsive one. And what happens if a person is locked away for a year, five years, a decade, two and a half decades, quarter of a century, and then you find out that they might have an autoimmune condition? What do you do then? So I'm going to give you three examples of that. Now, that being said, um, I want to warn you all that these are cases that we're just coming across and we, we're just trying to understand how many of these people are out there. As far as we can tell, this is a very rare thing. So my main point of my talk is not to argue that every person with mental illness should be tested for this. So be mindful of that. But I do think that there's something worth at least trying to address with my partners in neurology. Okay, so the outline for my talk, a uh, very brief historical perspective because I think that places uh, my position and my, my group's position in a specific context that will help you understand why we're after this, um, specifically on neuronal autoimmunity and mental illness. And again, like I mentioned, three brief case presentations that are all sort of unique in their own way, um, which all illustrate sort of basic points about different forms of neuronal autoimmunity um, and how they might look different. And when psychosis presents in that context of neuronal autoimmunity, does that psychosis look like going to go typical psychosis, like somebody who we would refer to as having schizophrenia, let's say, or does it look very different in these three cases? And where are the differences and, and what, what you should do with that? But the take home point is that these are three real life subjects, real people who all had severe treatment refractory primary psychotic disorders and all, and that's what the shared feature that they have, they all ended up as long-term patients in New York State mental health system. Um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but that essentially means that the sort of typical first and second line treatment routes failed or were only partially su successful. And somebody is then at that point no longer to, able to take care of themselves. And they usually end up in these facilities with continuous uh, care because they, get, they can't take care of their own ADLs, which, me, which, which is to say that these are very impaired individuals. Again, to illustrate key differences in disease mechanism and diagnostic workup and treatment for these three uh, particular examples. And then again, to ask the question, are there distinct clinical features of autoimmune associated psychosis or not? And if not, what do you do with it? When, when would you refer for screening? And then I'll talk very briefly about a new project that we recently started. It's not for the purpose of self-promotion, but just to place the work in context. We started a project called the New York State Precision Neuropsychiatry Project, where we are trying to collaborate with our partners like Joseph Delmao and trying to get a sense if we screen folks that are treatment refractory, sort of in the peripheral New York State hospital system, the people that don't typically get screened for anything, what if you take the ones there that look like they might have these, these syndromes that might be compatible with neuronal autoimmunity? What if you screen those? How many of those individuals end up having that? And that's still an open question, but that's something that we're interested in trying to answer. If, I, if you have any questions, please stop me along the way. Okay, so historical perspective. Um, as you probably all know, there's longstanding awareness amongst clinicians and healthcare providers uh, and, and, and general population folk that systemic autoimmune disorders can also affect the brain and peripheral nervous system, thereby leading to psychiatric and neurological symptoms. It's well known that well-known autoimmune conditions that are systemic like lupus, pemphigus, and multiple sclerosis all can involve components of psychosis or psychotic syndromes that can often look like clinically indistinguishable from schizophrenia. Of course, they occur in the context of this disease, which is why people are sort of able to sort of reconstruct whether this is psychosis associated with that particular autoimmune condition versus a separate entity or, or something different altogether. And there's, there's large-scale large, large scale register based studies that have shown or suggested that there's, if you have a history of any autoimmune uh, condition, uh, as, as mentioned a few examples of here, that you have about a 45% increase in the chance of also having schizophrenia. And conversely, an individual with schizophrenia have significantly higher rates of autoimmune condition uh, both in themselves and in their first degree relatives, all to suggest that autoimmunity and psychosis and psychiatric conditions have been linked through many different kinds of studies that have different degrees of methodological rigor rigorousness. But the data seems to suggest that psychiatric symptoms are not uncommonly associated with autoimmune conditions that affect the brain. <laughs> 
Now, something that I think is that less of you might have heard about is that there's actually an interesting literature out there that we still don't really know what to make of, which is that there were a series of papers in the 1950s that showed um, at the time that people thought that schizophrenia was an autoimmune condition. There wasn't much thinking about the mechanism, but there was a couple of groups, a couple of individual psychiatrists who took the route of giving high dose uh, steroids and gave that to treatment refractory schizophrenic patients or patients that were psychotic severely so just like the New York State cases I'm going to describe to you and they gave high dose steroids just to some extent out of des desperation. There wasn't much of a theoretical framework that underlined this but people just thought well nothing's working so let's try. And so there are a couple of case reports and case series that have been described that look like they were well executed and it looks fairly believable that in rare cases you see these dramatic improvements um, that have been described. So somebody who pioneered, well, I, I wouldn't know if I would call a pioneer, but somebody who's described a lot of these cases is Dr. Jay Cohn, the late Jay Cohn, who at the time was medical director at the Psychopharmacology Research Institute at UCLA. Um, and that work sort of led to an initial wave of enthusiasm. Um, and after that, a lot, a lot of sort of larger, better executed methodologically um, studies came out that aimed to see if you gave high levels of cortisone, would patients with schizophrenia improve? Most of those studies were negative. Now, mind you, this is nobody was stratified here. Everybody was just grouped together as having schizophrenia, was given high-dose steroids, quite high dose, in fact. And you can imagine if an autoimmune condition that looks like schizophrenia is very rare, the chance of you capturing that by randomly selecting a reasonably small number of schizophrenic individuals is not going to likely work. So that's sort of when that whole hype kind of died off. And then it sort of reemerged again, the interest in neuronal autoimmunity as, as being relevant for psychotic disorders and schizophrenia in particular, when people started looking again at, at this as a possible way for explaining these disorders. In the last 15 years, there have been many studies looking at serum levels of, of, um, of different levels of CK, um, CK molecules to see if they can associate with different symptoms and severity of symptoms in schizophrenics. Um, and so far, the data has not really all been that conclusive. It's really been since um, my colleague and friend Joseph Dalmau came to the field, as a lot of you guys have described, and he himself has described, that a lot of this renewed wave of interest came back, that for the first time somebody was delineating limbic encephalitis in a, in a real way. And as psychiatrists, it was a, a marvelous opportunity to sort of rethink what, what really is psychosis. Psychosis is not one thing, but this is a framework that we can use to try to understand what gives rise to psychosis in specific contexts without over-interpreting that and over-generalizing that to other people that have a genetically driven form of schizophrenia. But at least it's a starting point to rethink and test some of our hypotheses. Okay, so case number one, for full disclosure, was actually a case that I didn't see, but two of my colleagues... Jenna Gordon Elliott and Thomas Finch over there saw this patient, but the reason I wanted to share it with, with, um, with their permission is that it illustrates, a, I think, a really interesting point that I want to want to make. So this is Miss M, who at the time was 25 year old African American woman, who was diagnosed with schizophrenia since the age of 21, with a family history also positive for schizophrenia, which kind of can be misleading because then most of us tend to think that that's a genetic cause of that form of schizophrenia, who had been hospitalized for psychiatric reasons in a psychiatric hospital four times and then presented with altered mental status and agitation. And there were a bunch of clinical features that were what you would consider unusual for somebody who has a condition like schizophrenia, including unilateral face, facial stiffness, uh, sluggish speech, myoclonus, unexplained fever and tachycardia, which then spontaneously resolved and a treatment history with ECT, clozapine, which you tend to give for people that are not responsive to first-line antipsychotics, were all not effective. And ultimately, she ended up for one year at Manhattan Psychiatric Center. The Manhattan Psychiatric Center is one of these state hospitals that I was referring to. But to end up at that hospital means you must have failed multiple trials of neuroleptics for psychosis. And you end up on clozapine, which is sort of our last option typically a lot of the times. And if you fail that and you're behaviorally very difficult to manage, Unfortunately, you end up in places where your care is sort of taking over by staff full time around the clock. She ultimately developed, and this, this was a terrible thing, but ultimately it was, a, it was also a good thing because it gave away to the clinicians what was going on. She also ultimately developed autonomic instability and respiratory failure requiring to be admitted to the ICU. She was, she was sent back here to Cornell um, and was then uh, serum and CSF samples were taken and it was determined that she had anti-NMDA encephalitis. She was treated with intravenous IgG, steroids, and plasmapheresis. And um, the autonomic instability and respiratory problems were very successfully treated. However, the patient still had psychotic symptoms, um, and she was discharged back to psychiatric care. Um, it, 
in, in the fact that she had psychotic symptoms and they hadn't responded to those medicines that she was put on for the uh, MDA encephalitis led the clinicians at the time to conclude that perhaps the psychosis wasn't part of that syndrome after all. And she had this family history of schizophrenia. So the thinking at the time was not entirely illogical that she had two problems and one was taken care of and now she was back to have, uh, being a patient with schizophrenia. Now, several months later, she had another psychiatric hospitalization, was re-hospitalized because um, her psychiatric symptoms were very severe. Um, and it was now her sixth hospitalization for psychiatric symptoms. And a new hypothesis arose to the credit of my colleagues at Cornell, Thomas and Jenna, that um, perhaps the psychosis could be reconceptualized as potentially reflective of, of a partial response to the treatment for limbic encephalitis. Perhaps there's only been a partial response. And perhaps that also meant that if that is true, this patient is at an increased risk to redevelop autonomic instability, which is potentially a life-threatening condition. So the patient was readmitted and then treated here at Cornell with cyclophosphamide and rituximab, and that ent ended up doing the trick. Um, the psychosis ultimately resolved, and there was a tr dramatic improvement in cognition from what I understand. And last I heard, she's now entirely off neuroleptics. Um, it took a while for the cognitive rehabilitation, but this was somebody who was essentially went from being a mother, uh, taking care of a child, functional, to completely not functional on a trajectory that unfortunately my field usually means that's a downward spiral you don't get out of even with some of the best medicines if you're that sick, but she actually ultimately was discharged and is now off neuroleptics and doing quite well. So again, the point is not to generalize this to all patients with schizophrenia, but it's to show that in principle, this does happen. And in principle, we don't know how many of those folks at Manhattan Psychiatric Center or other places in the state hospital system might have this as well. So in general, chronic and severe psychosis is the main feature of limbic encephalitis. How can we find out? We now have improved knowledge about the clinical presentation of limbic encephalitis and should promote clinical awareness and, and awareness, a lot of that's been discussed today, about what workup should be initiated. So people have talked about MRI with flare without contrast and looking diffusion weight uh, images and looking at EEG for, for delta brush stroke. Ultimately, as everybody has discussed and as, as Joseph has shown in his lab, diagnosis ultimately is made by taking serum and CSF, and certainly CSF is critical for that, and looking at the sample and confirming that there's neural autoantibodies there. Treatment options is a wide range of immunosuppressants. First line options include intravenous IgG. You also have rituximab and cyclophosphamide, which were mentioned. And improvements can be dramatic, but still require sometimes, in some cases, multiple rounds of treatment, sometimes different agents, and cognitive rehabilitation is something that's often not talked about because it may not be as a sexy a topic because somebody com gets a lot better, but if they're not able to be reintegrated into the workforce because they have cognitive impairment, that is still is something that, that should be thought about. And a lot of these folks, it takes quite a long time to come back to their previous level of cognitive functioning. If there's a suspicion that limbic encephalitis is perineoplastic, for obvious reasons, you need to then also do the workup for cancer. Now, I thought it might be helpful here just as a psychiatrist to sort of put in, and some of these things have already been said, how do you differentiate schizophrenia from NMDA receptor encephalitis-related psychosis? There's no clear answer that there's dramatic differences in that. They can look quite the same. It's usually the course of illness in limbic encephalitis that ultimately gives it away. But there are some things that you can think about. Symptom-wise, it's pretty similar. Hallucinations, positive symptoms, negative symptoms, thought disorganization, you see in both. Catatonia, the symptom where people become stiff. Um, and rigid, you can see perhaps a little bit more commonly in anti-NMDA encephalitis and other um, organic forms of psychosis. Um, the onset, schizophrenia typically, as has been mentioned before, it's prodromal onset can take months to years, followed then by a psychotic break. Um, in anti-NMDA encephalitis, it can be more of a subacute or acute perineoplastic uh, or not presentation, or it can be post-viral. The course can be in schizophrenia progressive over many years, Whereas in anti-NMDA, it can be progressive, can fluctuate. You can have lucid intervals when people look fine, and you can have a case of spontaneous remission as well. Schizophrenic patients are typically alert and oriented times three just fine. Uh, in anti-NMDA cases, people can become delirious over time and become quite confused. Comorbidity in schizophrenia is nothing that stands out specifically, whereas in limbic encephalitis, you can have myoclonus, movement disorders, headaches, autonomic instability, a whole range of things that ultimately often tip people off that this is something that they need to be on the lookout for as a clinician. EEGs in schizophrenia show nonspecific things. You can see you can see diffuse slowing, but it's not all that common. It's usually medication effects that you see. Whereas with limbic encephalitis, again, you see focal and diffuse slow activities. Frequently, you can see seizure activity, extreme delta brush, which is sort of thought of 
as something to look for in 30% of the cases. So there are things at least that can help you sort of narrow your window and your focus. MRIs in schizophrenia typically show cortical atrophy and in enlarged ventricles, whereas in anti-NMDA, you get to see signs of inflammation, medial temporal lobe. You can see that specifically there in the hippocampus on T2-weight images, fluid attenuated, flare sequences. CSF in schizophrenia is very nonspecific if it shows everything at all. Obviously, we've talked about that a lot in here, limbic encephalitis. You have all sorts of things that you can see, oligo oligoclonal bands, um, pleocytosis. You can obviously see the autoantibodies themselves. Treatment for schizophrenia, the hallmark treatment for schizophrenia is antipsychotics. For anti-NMDA encephalitis, it's immunosuppression. Again, IVIGG, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, plasmapheresis, and so on. Prognosis for schizophrenia it tends to be a cr chronic and debilitating disease. Limic encephalitis, you do see cases of dramatic improvement, although there might be residual effects. In some cases, it becomes chronic. But like uh, Dr. Delmel pointed out, for a reasonable portion of the folks, um, 75 to 80 some percent, you'll, you get a good response, which is, which is a remarkable thing. Now, sh switching gears, this is an entirely different case. This is case number two, Miss P. She was a 64-year-old Caucasian woman who was admitted to Bronx Psychiatric Center in 2017. She had been undergoing treatment there since 1999 for what was considered and diagnosed as schizophrenia paranoid type. Um, was reportedly compliant with her medication and had been put on all kinds of psychotropics, including atypical and typical antipsychotics and cl cl uh, clozapine, and had never shown any degree of response. Her psychiatric history was characterized by multiple admissions for psychotic symptoms, alternating with what is relevant to point out here, symptom-free periods that would last years. Now, for those of you who know people with, with a mental illness, or in particular with a psychotic illness like schizophrenia, that's not typical. It, does, it is described, but usually people have functional decline that continues over the years. This was somebody who would be very ill for quite some time and then get better and then look essentially like you and I do and then go back to being quite psychotic. The other thing which sort of gives away what this case is about is that her medical history was notable for Hashimoto's thyroiditis, for which she had been treated with thyroid hormone replacement and no steroids because at the time she was already hypothyroid when she was seen, so she was put on hormone replacement therapy rather than a, a steroid trial, which could also be beneficial if the Hashimoto's is affecting one's brain. So because of the, number one, the treatment resistance, she had not showed any response to any drug. The atypical course, again, the inter intervals where she was completely in remission, it seemed like. And number three, the medical history of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the diagnosis of Hashimoto's encephalopathy was considered. CSF showed an elevated protein, EEG showed diffuse slow waves, which is nonspecific, and her MRI was normal. And then the patient was started on essentially a steroid trial, which is sort of the, the typical thing people give for Hashimoto's encephalopathy, high-dose corticosteroids, two milligrams per kilograms per day, and then ultimately tapered off her neuroleptics. Now, her psychiatric symptoms cleared over the course of the next three to four weeks, and then gradually, after the next two weeks after that, she was ta gradually tapered off her uh, steroids to a maintenance dose of 20 milligrams a day of oral prednisone. She was, she was switched from, uh, from IV to oral. And the patient then was, essentially went into a remission and has stayed in remission for the last year and a half. And what do we know about Hashimoto's encephalopathy? This has also obviously been talked about a lot today, and I, I was very moved to hear some of the descriptions of clinical cases, and it's, 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 we have to admit that we still know very little, but it's, it's important that we study this, and, and that's also why I think psychiatry, neurology, medicine have to work together on this thing. And people were talking about the, the importance of multidisciplinary teams. I think I couldn't agree with that more because a lot of these things, we're, we're, we're missing them because we're sort of stratifying the way that our care is provided. Hashimoto's encephalopathy was first reported by Brain um, et al. in 19, 1966, was referred to then by him as Hashimoto's encephalopathy, has been later on referred to as stirred responsive encephalopathy and associated autoimmune thyroiditis. Many people agree that that's potentially quite a problematic name because it suggests that you have a responsiveness to a drug and that that constitutes a disease. I think that's something that's a principle that you can almost never apply because what if you have the same disease and you don't respond? Does it not mean that that's not that disease? It, it organizes the, the thinking in, a, in, I think, a misleading way. So my personal stance is that Hashimoto's encephalopathy is a, is a better way to refer to that. But it's characterized by encephalopathy associated Presumably, this is the assumption now, but again, I want to stress there's very little that we know. Anti-TPO, anti-thyroid peroxidase, and or anti-thyroglobulin uh, autoantibodies or both in the absence of any other alternative causes. Now, that's sort of the key words to take home here, in the absence of alternative causes. So it's by, you, you just diagnose this mostly by exclusion, by ruling out other things. So 
We still do not know if the anti-TPO or anti-thyroglobulin is really driving the disease or if this isn't what, what people refer to as an epiphenomenon, a nonspecific marker of autoimmunity that is helpful to sort of screen for things, but it doesn't really tell you what's going on in that particular person in their brain or in their peripheral nervous system. I mean, this is a realization that this is relevant to look at that only came recently. Dr. Del Mao's lab is now looking into it. Many other labs have described cases, but this is a young, we're still in the early stages of trying to, trying to understand how this works. But it's an important thing to figure out, as has been discussed today. Disease mechanism is unknown. It's unclear, again, like I said, the anti-thyroid autoantibodies, whether they are actually playing a critical disease-modifying role or if they're non-specific markers of autoimmunity. The prevalence, we also don't know of Hashimoto's encephalopathy because it's not been systematically screened for and it remains to underdiagnose. That's the assumption. Um, the clinical presentation can also vary. There's people that have have these high titers and have minor cognitive impairment, and there's people that are entirely demented or have full-blown schizophrenia-like presentations or status epilepticus. So the, the range of things that you see is wide. There's not a clear correlation that we can have determined yet, as of yet, that suggests that the, it's the level of the titer that correlates with the severity. So it becomes very hard to sort of see a patient at a cross-sectional moment, see what their titer is, and then say, you must have this because of this. We're just, we're just not there yet, but we need to get there. Only about one in three patients, a third, have known thyroid disease with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So the, 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 the notion that you should have a Hashimoto's thyroiditis to have Hashimoto's encephalopathy turns out to be wrong. So anti-thyroid autoantibodies can be and can and should be systematically tested in all patients with unexplained encephalopathy. Some people argue in the serum, patients that ultimately were found to quote unquote have this clinical syndrome retrospectively in a case series of 251 cases, the largest one to date, um, 34 were found to have anti-TPO autoantibodies, 7% had only isolated anti-thyroglobulin, and about 69, almost two-thirds, had both. When they looked into CSF as opposed to serum, they found anti-TPO autoantibodies in about 20%, anti-thyroglobulin in four, and both in about half of the patients. So again, it's, it's not a perfect test to always capture this, and it's hard to interpret, but if you have a high titer, it definitely seems worth following up on with additional workup and, and testing. While antithyroid autoantibodies are critical for establishing the diagnosis, according to some, this is still not where, where the field is. Um, and again, it's been estimated about 10 to 13% of normal subjects who have not no cognitive, no neuropsychiatric symptoms at all have these high titers of these autoantibodies against the thyroid. So it sort of shows you the difficulty that if normal controls, normal folks like you and I walk around and have these autoantibodies, there's only so much interpretation that you can do based on just that lab test. That only gets you so far. The presence of the antithyroid autoantibodies in the CSF could make a difference that perhaps in the CSF having those autoantibodies is more relevant for establishing whether or not somebody has disease. The numbers that we have for those are very limited. Dr. Del Mal's lab is one of the first labs that's systematically looking at it, but we still have a long road ahead to get a sense of how common is it to have those autoantibodies in, in your CSF. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's much less common than in the serum. That would be a logical assumption, but we have to first do those, do those studies to determine that. The review paper that went over the 251 cases described that the, the wide range of phenotypes that you see associated with this condition is rather wide with neuropsychiatric symptoms that include convulsions, confusion in about half of all patients, speech disorder in about a third, memory impairment in about half, gait disturbance in about a third, persecutory delusions and other isolated psychotic symptoms in about 10 to 20 percent, depending on which of the reviews you look at, progressive memory impairment getting to the point of dementia, in about 11% and then 10% had isolated psychiatric symptoms. Now this shows you sort of the, the struggle in my field. There's a lot of people out there now screening for all kinds of autoantibodies and people are creating st stories and narratives around that, which I think I understand. I mean, I have, I have family members who have mental illness. I, I, I can relate to this, but I think there's also a lot of harm that we in psychiatry can do by not sort of saying what we don't know, because it's, it's okay to not to admit what you don't know and then to do a proper workup and sort of try to interpret it to the best of your abilities. But overstating data is also not helpful and also can be quite harmful as well. The psychosis associated with Hashimoto's is typically described, again, as a schizophrenia-like presentation, can be chronic. There's actually a case report that describes somebody who, for 40 years on and off, had psychotic symptoms that look, schizophrenia, that look and sound schizophrenia-like by description. That person ultimately responded with the corticosteroid trial. Um, there's been other reports of 20 years of hist history, of 20 years of psychosis, people that still responded. So these are things that are pretty impressive to read about. But again, a lot of these cases sound like they're relatively mild psychosis, not like the ones that I'm describing here, people that end up in state hospitals unable to take care of themselves. That's sort of a different degree of, of severity. 
C7 analysis can be show mild to moderate elevation in protein in about 78 to 82%. Pleocytosis you see in about 16 to 20%. EEG findings in Hashimoto's can show in the majority 84% or higher diffuse slowing without epileptic activity. And then in about 14%, you actually see bona fide epileptic activity on its own. MRI abnormality you see in about half of the patients. Most common finding is nonspecific wide matter hyperintensities. Steroids alone are first-line treatment. They're highly effective in, in, the, in the, of course, this is retrospective data. We describe cases that respond more so than when they don't. So there's a bit of a bias there. But, but that being said, there are dramatic descriptions of people coming out of these states on steroids. That is just like the papers in the 50s. There are pa papers that describe this, and it seems like that's believable. Um, 89 to 91% to of the patients described in these, in these retrospective studies show partial or complete response in terms of their neuropsych symptoms. The, the assumption is that the earlier you start, the better, which I think is a logical assumption that's true for, for a lot of disease in, 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 in humans. But in, with autoimmune-mediated mechanisms, you can see the longer they are around, the more downstream effects you get that are harder to reverse. Autoimmunosuppressive drugs like IVIGG and rituximab have been described but not systematically studied yet. That needs to be done. IV steroids and oral prednisone appear to show similar response rates with the psychosis and the other symptoms reversing. So you can do oral prednisone rather than IV steroids, which is a benefit. And overall, about 10 to 19% of our patients who have this show that they have relapses. So even though you might treat one episode, you want to be vigilant, this might come back. Overall, to sort of resummarize, Hashimoto's encephalopathy is a rare syndrome with a range of clinical neuropsychiatric presentations that should be considered in patients who have either acute or subacute encephalopathy-like presentations with progressive cognitive impairment and or isolated or combined uh, psychiatric signs that can look sometimes like schizophrenia-like presentations without an obvious etiology being present. So it's, again, it's sort of the pattern recognition for better or for worse that we use, and then it's you use your serological markers, and with caution, you try to interpret them as the field is trying to figure out how, what to make of them. Okay, my third case, this is the, the person that we saw over the course of the last year, and it's really the heart of my talk. My take home point is that everything I said before, I stand by, but there are also moments when you see somebody and you just you sort of have to let go of everything you know and you still have to try something. And this was a case where we really were quite skeptical that we were going to make um, make a lot of progress, but we still thought it was worth a shot. And this patient has had a tremendous impact on me and my team. Um, I've actually I didn't realize, but I actually have known her for over 20 years. Um, and I'll tell you her story because it's it's uh, I think at the end of the day it's an inspirational story. So Ms. B is a 47-year-old African-American woman who was valedictorian um, of her high school and then was at the University of Maryland and was always on the dean's list there for each semester. The point of saying this was, this was a, first of all, it was a lovely lady, but most importantly, she was a high, very high-functioning, very intelligent person who had not had a prodrome that typically is described for schizophrenia where you gradually decline. She had not had that at all. She looked fine. And then she developed acutely uh, very fluorid psychosis at the age of 21. She was then hospitalized at Pilgrim Psychiatric Center. I don't know if you guys know this, but this is a facility out in Long Island. Very, where the, the most severe patients end up and usually don't get out, so they sp spend the rest of their lives there, sometimes decades. And she had been markedly declined. Now, what was unusual was she went from top of her class at the University of Maryland within three months to being unable to take herself to the toilet converse in any meaningful way and not experience psychotic symptoms pretty much 24 seven. So she was hospitalized when I was there, I was there on a, on a Fulbright and I remember her cause she was the sickest patient I'd ever seen. Now, I hadn't seen that many patients, but now we're 20 some years later and I still haven't seen a sicker person than that lady that day. Um, it was remarkable. I mean, she literally has stood at the nurse's desk, standing stiff, catatonic, bent over, talking repetitively about delusions, seeing things continuously, not eating, not letting anybody wash her for 20 years. Nothing worked. She has not been outside for 20 years, out of sight of the hospital, even though people want them to take breaks. So it was pretty dramatic. Over those 20 years, constantly responding to internal stimuli, alert and oriented times zero, meaning she was not oriented to time, place, and person. She didn't know where she was, who she was. She thought she was in Maryland. She was in a courtroom. This is not how typical schizophrenia looks like. That's, that's, that's something that's important to point out. Now, somebody else mentioned the MOCA, assessment of cognitive function. She scored a four most of the time. A four is basically like the lowest number that you can score where you're severely impaired cognitively. Um, rarely she would score in the 12 range, but that's still severely demented range. And she became incontinent for a st stool and urine. 
All antipsychotics that are worth trying were tried. I think her care was actually quite good, believe it or not. People really tried mood stabilizers, ECT, um, nothing made a difference. And ultimately, she was diagnosed. So we saw her a, few, a year and a half ago for a study that we were doing. And my fellow, Anthony Zogby, was screening her chart. And he noticed, after we had reviewed the Hashimoto's thyroiditis literature and Hashimoto's encephalopathy, that in 2008, she actually had been diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis was found to have an anti-TPO level of 1,200, which is quite high. Sorry? Yeah. No, it, it is a shocking story. This, 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 I, still, I still sometimes pinch myself. She had an anti-TPO level of 1,200, but she was never started on steroids. Now, it's easy for me to criticize that in hindsight, but the truth is that was not the worst call to make because the endocrine person did that test, and at that point, her thyroid hormone was already so low that somebody who did not know about Hashimoto's encephalopathy, which is, frankly was a lot of people in tertiary care hospitals, they would not think to give her on steroids because the thyroid had sort of scarred over enough that at that point you replaced the hormone. Now, of course, I don't like the fact that they didn't try, but I understand why. Now, now part of our job is to make sure that that doesn't happen again. But finding that, we realized we need to bring her to the hospital and find out what, what went on. So we transferred her to Columbia about a year ago. She's been with us for a year, full year. Um, and we started to work up there. So we admitted her to neurology. Our colleagues, we work very closely with them, and they deserve a lot of credit for this for this story. We did an extensive workup, extensive neuropsychological testing to have a sense of how she was impaired, did labs across the board for a whole range of neuro, different kinds of neuro auto, autoimmunity, serum and CSF samples. We called up our close colleague, Josep, see if he wanted to take a look. We called the Hashimoto's expert at Mayo. We literally brought in the biggest team we could get with the people that we trusted. Uh, we did video EG monitoring for over one and a half to two days, MRIs that showed localized atrophy by temporally, and FDG PET showed all these kinds of lesions. Um, and then the labs came back and showing a quite high, initially highly positive ANA, um, and then anti-double strand DNA came back positive, anti-Sjogren came back positive, and anti-histone IgG antibodies came back positive as well. So serologically speaking, uh, we had a big multidisciplinary Columbia-wide case conference, but the consensus became pretty clear that she had essentially had lupus, so SLE lupus. Um, we brought in all the colleagues from Columbia that were relevant for that, neurology, neuroimmunology, rheumatology with specific lupus experts, our partners in endocrine, uh, Bob McConnell, who works on Hashimoto's, our own folks in psychiatry, we brought medical ethics people, neuropsychologists, you name it. Um, because we had to sort of figure out what to do with this lady, because she could not articulate herself, she had no capacity to consent to anything, but this life was, she was withering away. So after the diagnosis was established with neuropsychiatric uh, lupus or lupus cerebritis as it used to be called what was remarkable was that lupus we always think of presents itself with a with a myriad of symptoms now these are always assumptions that we make because that's where we diagnose the disease we describe it in our textbooks and then it sort of propagates for the future but could there be patients that have an isolated brain form of lupus that have high titers in their serum and that's all they have it's possible how would we know we're not structurally assessing those folks in my field that's for sure so the question was, is this a primary, she has schizophrenia, that we know. She has, serologically speaking, neurolupus, that we know. The imaging is consistent with that. The story is consistent with it, but the question is, are they causally related? So to test that hypothesis, we were going to treat the lupus as we would treat it in any neuro, neuro clinic she would walk into, and we were going to monitor carefully if her psychiatric symptoms would improve. So we, we decided by consensus, these are treatment algorithms that are published, a minimum of six cycles with IV, solu IV solumedrol, high dose steroids for five days with a single dose of cyclophosphamide for six cycles separated by a month. A treatment algorithm was developed by the International Neurolupus Consortium, which was developed in Leiden in the Netherlands, um, which we spoke, who we spoke with as well. Um, and there's a similar treatment algorithm that I wasn't aware of at the time that was developed by the MGH group from neurology for treatment refractory multiple sclerosis, where they do a very similar increase that's quite long. I mean, it's hefty on the steroid dosing, but then over the course of two and a half years, they taper you off. So the point here is, if you've accumulated inflammation over the course of two and a half decades, this is also what Joseph said, you have to be patient. You can't expect these people to turn around as dramatically as you sometimes see for an early caught NMDA receptor encephalitis. This is going to take time. So I wanted to make sure that everybody had realistic expectations, because if you say, oh, we need to see a dramatic improvement, and you don't see it, then the show's over. So we had extensive discussion, importantly, with her, the patient. We couldn't really talk with because she wasn't comprehending, but her family. We spoke with them endlessly. Her brother was the healthcare proxy. He felt strongly we should give this a try. Medical ethics got involved. 
Um, because this was not a trivial decision to make, obviously. And the, the idea is that we were going to carefully implement the treatment plan. We were going to closely monitor for worsening and improvement, frequent consultation with all our relevant consulting teams, and ultimately we were we would reconsenter each time after each cycle of treatment, each time with the brother to make sure that he still felt that we should proceed with this, to be extra cautious. Now, this sort of shows the main point of what I'm trying to bring home is, again, not everybody with schizophrenia has lupus, but this shows you that you can't afford to miss it. That's, that's the bottom line here. So clock drawing is part of the MOCA. You have a baseline MOCA that, where she drew it for the first time. Her first clock drawing where you're supposed to draw a clock with the numbers and the arrows, and you're supposed to draw the exact time that it says. And her first clock was pretty terrible. You can see that on the left. So there's no, there's no circle here. There's no number. So this, is, this was when her MOCA score was about four. And then the early treatment started, and it's sort of interesting because it sort of evolved her clock drawing sort of in front of your eyes. So then it became sort of a hemi-neglect looking like clock where you see sort of a, a clock halfway and the other half it has nothing. And then we had the, after the second round of steroid treatment, so the first round did not, did, did not do as much as we hoped, but then the second round, then this clock came out. And now she's been drawing clocks fine for like about <laughs> nine months. So that's, I mean, right. I mean, and it, we still have a long road ahead with her because she she still fluctuates quite a bit. But we're trying to understand, like, should we not go into the state hospital system and look at this structurally? Yes. I think the way you're describing it is you, you're, you're using the term schizophrenia to mean that it can be caused by an autoimmune condition. Everything in psychiatry is a phenomenology-based diagnosis. It doesn't have anything to do with etiology. So in some ways, I agree with what you're saying, but schizophrenia doesn't say anything about the cause of it. But I know what you're saying. This is not typical schizophrenia caused by genetics, but even what, what is that even? We don't even know what that is. Oh, exactly. I don't think, first of all, I don't put too much weight in what my field calls a diagnosis at all. I, I speak the language, but I don't care what we call this. I, I care that this woman is ill and she shows signs of psychosis and she has an autoimmune condition and it shows improvement with immunosuppression. And now we're, we're taking it one day at a time. But we still take it one day at a time. Could she also have a psychiatric condition on the side? That's It's possible, right? So again, as exciting as this is, we're also trying to not overgeneralize and trying to take it one day at a time. But the truth is, this woman was going to go back to Pilgrim and basically stand there for another three decades. That's not happening. So that, if that's that's all we know, that that's something. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. I agree. I think we're saying the same thing, and I agree with you. And I'm agnostic to what we call it in psychiatry. We've called things so many things so many times, and I don't. I'm I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. Let's get this lady better. She has a brain disease, and that's 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 what we try to focus on. Right. So I'll, I'm wrapping up. This is only two more slides. The MOCA again improved from four to twelve, and then to twenty-one. So she was no longer as cognitively impaired. Her overall function, and this is a good take-home point, vastly improved. Forget about diagnostics, forget about diagnostic terms. This woman started to take care of herself. She started to shower herself. She started combing her hair. She never did that for two decades. Toilet training, no, she never ate. She had to be forcefully fed. She started eating on her own, enjoying her food, socially engaged. I mean, these are the parameters that matter. We can do these studies, we can in investigate things and win Nobel Prizes, but if we don't improve the quality of life of a single patient, then what are we doing, right? So this is, and in, in limbic encephalitis, Doctors like Dr. Delmo have, have, have saved lives, have improved lives. In psychiatry, we're, we're coming at it from a very different angle, and we were not as optimistic that we were going to be able to do that here, but we're, that's why we're, we're staying at it with this lady. She became an alert, alert and oriented times three. She knows who she is, where she is, what date it is. She's less perseverative, no longer psychotic. She tends to her ADLs. Um, yeah, it's been remarkable. Then we took the video to Pilgrim Psychiatric Center and said, has she ever been like this? And then they started tearing up and whatnot, so we made sure that they said that that wasn't the case. And now she just finished her fourth cycle and has, as of yet, not developed any symptoms. And that's not trivial because she's on high-dose steroids. You can get a vascular hypnocrosis, all sorts of other issues, so you have to be very careful in monitoring UTIs and things like that. But um, it seems like it's worth a shot. I'm not going to get into this, but the, the point is we're doing six cycles with high-dose steroids. 
with cyclophosphamide, single dose, five cycles after careful consideration, then we're going to reevaluate. Do we continue at that point? Do we stop? Do we switch? Do we not? But my, my, my gut feeling is that it's gonna, we're going to continue for a little while longer since she's shown consistent improvement at each of these cycles. So the, the neural lupus treatment algorithm that I put here is essentially the same as the one that we had developed on our own based on the feedback that we got, which was reassuring to, to hear. So neural lupus, although it's been recognized over 140 years ago, um, we know very little about the pathophysiology that underlies it. It's sort of like the disease that can look like many things with a thousand faces. Um, the degree of, um, it's, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, you see that 12 to 95% of the patients can have neural lupus symptoms and 12 to about 85% of the cases can have psychosis. So what that tells you is that a lot of the studies that describe this don't really know what the accurate numbers are. There's not a lot of good studies. Um, it's important that we, uh, the important insights have been developed about genetic causes of, of lupus, although we don't have that fully worked out yet. We have some sense of that and non-genetic causes that trigger certain uh, uh, flares, flare-ups of the disease and the disease activity overall. But overall, we still know very little about what causes the neural lupus symptoms overall and how we can better treat those. And that all being said, neural lupus contributes significantly to the morbidity and the mortality associated with lupus. Overall, lupus is characterized by loss of immune tolerance. You get autoantibodies, you get immune complexes that deposit in tissue and cause damage. There's disru disruption of the blood-brain barrier integrity. All sorts of cytokines flood into the brain and small molecules that cause damage there. Different IL, IL-1, 6, 8, and 17 and tumor necrosis factor have been all implicated, but nothing is clear that it's sort of the sole, sole cause. There's also this phenomenon of, a, of an acute confusional state where 4 to 7% have um, waxing and waning of, the, of their consciousness state, which sort of look like what our patient had in combination with their psychosis. So the question is, does she have these two things or one thing altogether? But from a treatment perspective, it doesn't really matter. And then the last thing I'll end on is that we now want to figure out, besides this one patient, how many other patients are out there we should systematically assess for this. So we started the New York State Precision Neuropsychiatry Project, where we're now going to screen a subset of the most criteria meet the patients that meet criteria out of the 3,000 inpatients in the New York State mental health system. Um, and the question is, for a significant portion of those, um, all of them are treatment refractory, all of them are chronic, chronically impaired. And we partnered up with David Goldstein, who's the head of the Institute for Genomic Medicine at Columbia, who's going to help us with whole genome sequencing, as well as with Joseph Damao to look at neural autoimmunity structurally in this population, because this might be where the patients end up that have this, that are missed, because they don't respond to conventional methods and, and meds, and then they end up impaired for decades, locked away in these hospitals. We see patients with all kinds of exotic, quote-unquote, neurological presentations next to their psychosis that have never been tested for anything. So we feel like that's the place to start. Um, and it's a close collaboration with OMH, the Office of Mental Health, um, that, that's very supportive of that, and the Chapman Perlman Foundation is supporting that. So the, the OMH Health Commissioner Ann Sullivan and Tom Smith have been very supportive, and the last five NIMH directors have come around to thinking that this is worth doing, meaning systematically screening this in psychiatric patient populations. Josh Gordon is our current NIMH director who is strongly behind that, and we now recently got support from the Roy Vagelos and the Chapman Perlman Foundations to pursue this. And it takes a village. This I cannot stress enough how many people have been part of this story as it's emerging. I was a CL um, psychiatry resident 10 years ago when Joseph was kind enough to come over to do grand rounds with me to talk about his experience with his pioneering work that inspired me and so many others here today to carry that forward. Um, so Joseph has been a major source of inspiration. Our chairman, Dr. Lieberman, my, my fellow um, Anthony Zogby, and I, Don, my study coordinator, have all really done a lot of the work. Um, and it's been remarkable to, to work side by side by my colleagues in neurology and medicine on this. Thank you. Thank you.